So I'm rewatching Charlie Brooker's screen wipe, as any self-respecting video SES should, and wh wait a minute, is that is that Ben Wheatley? Starting off making viral internet shorts in the early noughties, Ben Wheatley's first feature film Down Terrace was shot in eight days, paid for out of his own pocket, and launched the career of one of the most intriguing independent filmmakers working today. His eclectic tastes have taken him from horror to comedy. Never thought about murdering innocent people like that before. No, he's not a person, Tina, he's a Daily Mail reader. To sci-fi with an adaptation of J.G. Ballard's High Rise, a few episodes of Doctor Who, and his recent adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, proving he's worthy of mainstream validation. Blending social realism and Lynchian surrealism, he... <sighs> but I'm doing a thing here, aren't I? I'm ascribing the success of these films to The Lone Genius, a single auteur whose films are the result of their inborn brilliance, and ignoring a whole team of creatives including one of the most exciting up-and-coming storytellers working today. Which is why today's employee of the month is Amy Jump, the best writer you've never heard of. Credited writer and editor on most of her husband's films, Amy Jump has actually driven the creative vision behind many of them. And I was talking to Amy Jump, who wrote the script, and then Amy did her first draft, which turned out to have nothing of the things I'd written in, the, in my last draft. So at that point, my name disappeared off the script. Those virals I mentioned were actually collaborations between the both of them, hosted on Mr. and Mrs. Wheatley.com, a home for their shorts and animation that became a catalogue for advertisers to browse their talents and offer jobs that kick-started their careers. Do you remember this from the early days of the internet? They did that. After Down Terrace became an indie hit, Jump and Wheatley's film at collaboration began in earnest with 2011's hitman horror, Kill List. Opening as a social realist thriller, we follow the character of Jay, a hitman for hire, as he crosses names off his titular Kill List. Upon realising one of his targets is a friend of Prince Andrew, he goes rogue, and the moment the film gets to this scene, We start to realise Amy Jump is subverting a great many things here. Hitmen, thieves and bank robbers are considered to be folk heroes in a lot of ways, enigmatic everyman sticking it to authority. But Jump's writing pushes you into a place of moral authority, with the use of increasingly obscene violence, tinged with her trademark black humour of course. The fuck are we going to do with him now? Brilliant. Jay's wife Shell is aware of and complicit in his business, established as a couple under severe financial strain in the wake of the 2008 recession. I think the 80s recession was a lot more glamorous. That financial strain forces him to take the job in the first place, from a nameless, enigmatic client. That stress and the background tension of the film is compounded by Jay's history as a soldier in Iraq, a history he recounts to his son in the form of a fairy tale. Well, once these two brave and honourable soldiers they're in charge of guarding a man in a car. There are multiple Arthurian references in the film, a touchstone I've talked about before, if you want to check it out. I want a story about King Arthur. More stories better. This, amongst other things, creates a nostalgia for an age of moral surety. The Iraq War, a conflict of massive devastation with no clear moral purpose, has broken Jay and his faith in anything we used to place moral faith in. The targets on his list all represent once benighted institutions, now sullied by our increasing awareness of their corruption, religion in particular. Whether it's an abusive priest or an insufferable performance of onward Christian soldiers. Oh, you're giving me indigestion. God's love can be hard to swallow. Yeah, not as hard as a dinner plate. <laughs> Jay is left yearning for something as clear and sure as one of King Arthur's crusades. The Nazis, wish I could have had a go at him. Difficult for a man to know where he stands these days. He's instead left with no crusade of his own to fight, and his descent into horrendous violence shatters his moral compass even further than a morally dubious war or a financial recession. Doesn't feel wrong. They're bad people. They should suffer. But as the film unfolds, odd things start to emerge. Whether it's a sacrificial offering, the presence of Wiccan symbols, or his targets repeated thanks for their own assassination. Thank you. 
even his client defines his task as reconstruction possibly an allusion to Christian Reconstruction, the belief in a return to non-democratic religious rule that re-emerged in the early 2000s. The film slowly twists into a folk horror tale. His clients revealed as cultists and his recruitment implied to be a carefully designed summoning ritual. The ritual the film culminates in bears a lot of similarities to that of Hereditary, including a possible antichrist figure, unwitting child sacrifice, naked cultists, and a crowning ceremony. It does away with the unnecessary exposition dump at the end of that film, and did it seven years earlier. Amy Jump twists genre conventions to tell an allegory about our loss of faith in institutions we once relied on, and the shock and confusion of our moral compass in the wake of world-changing events. She contextualizes a hit not as a shady business deal, but as a Faustian contract with a devilish figure. For what is a contract to kill, other than the signing away of your soul? But this idea of a brain trust couple isn't new. It has a long history in the industry. Behind every great man, there's a great woman is a tired phrase, one I'd redefine as behind every great artist, there's a team of artists. Alfred Hitchcock is considered an iconic auteur filmmaker, but it's often left unemphasized that his career, his best moments in movies, were often as much the result of his wife, Alma Revel's genius, as his. LA Times writer Charles Champlin later said of the pair, The Hitchcock touch had four hands, and two of them were Alma's. When she and Alfred met, he was her junior, just a graphic designer while she was a writer and editor, his position so lowly Alfred felt that he needed three years of career advancement before he could even approach her. Their marriage formed a working relationship that gradually became more entrenched as their careers blossomed. That iconic music in Psycho's infamous shower scene? Hitchcock didn't want music, that scene was scored on Alma's insistence. I do not want music over the Shah murder scene. But what Alma and I talked about is really gonna play. Bernie, the images must work on their own. Yes, but you can't scare people just by going boo. All right, you do it then, you, you know it best. They have to... She had established a career long before they met, her script work especially spilling the banks of her husband's portfolio out into a dozen other works, stretching from the 1920s all the way up to the mid 50s. It got to the point where Hitchcock couldn't make a creative decision without her input, something he acknowledged in his acceptance speech for the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1979, a year before his death. Alma Revel, I share my award as I have my life with her. While working at Gainsborough Studios, many felt Alma had what it takes to be a director herself. On that, she said, I'm too small. I could never project the image of authority a director has to project. This was the received wisdom of the 20s, but it makes me ask, does that thinking still apply in the modern day? The field in England depicts the aftermath of an English Civil War battle, survivors from both sides fleeing the conflict, only to happen upon a field ringed with mushrooms. In an attempt to pull someone free of it, they are instead sucked in, and descend into an hallucinogenic dreamscape where the enigmatic figure of O'Neill forces them to divine the location of treasure he is convinced is buried there. It's a surreal folk horror tale, one that offers many interpretations. It can be dismissed as a massive shroom trip the characters experience, or a depiction of purgatory, a space in which the battle's casualties must prove their worth for heaven or hell to the satanic figure of O'Neill. What do you see, friend? Nothing. Perhaps. Only shadows. There's a continued theme of shadows and doubles, characters reflecting one another, established by the presence of a scrying mirror a device believed to divine the past, present, and future. Characters slowly morph into the shape of one another, or break apart, a theme reinforced by an hallucinatory montage that acts as a pivot point in the middle of the film. This lends itself to the theory that all the characters are fragments of the same man, who must reconcile his warring faith, rationality, and emotions in an age where quack science was beginning to question the nature and authority of God, a conflict that the English Civil War was ultimately about. 
But rewatching the film in context of Amy Jump's filmography, the magic trick that really stood out to me was her use of dialogue. You are confused, sir. It is I who am capturing you, not the other way round. Do not concern yourself with bravery and I won't have. It is official. You are my prisoner. A field in England forgoes the common cop-out of modernising historical dialogue, and instead doubles down on making it all period accurate. The master is of advanced years, as you know. Your outrageous pillage has greatly aggravated his dropsy. That's hard enough to do at the best of times, but even so, Jump's use is multi-layered. It manages to distinguish an entire cast of characters, modulating their speech along the lines of class, wit, education and personality. What's he say? He says the next time his master sends him on a job, he won't fuck it up. It includes appropriate points of historical reference, sometimes inscrutable, other times just funny. What mission would that be, Mary? Pegging out the wash. It's clear Jump is an incredibly well-read writer. The library of wording, phraseology and historical reference required to write this fluently must be vast. The pissing disease, uh, St Anthony's fire, iliac passion, hemorrhoids and palsy. And she brings that historical context to the film's genre. It often plays with the iconography of the cowboy movie. Not just the broad rim hats, but also the film's search for buried treasure, a mainstay of the Western genre. Soldiers of the English Civil War would be the same people ultimately settling America, and in a way, the film acts as something of a proto-cowboy movie itself. It even has a vintage shootout. Compounding all these elements, Jump weaves it together around the ongoing theme of intimacy between men. The characters meet as strangers. Formed merely by the alchemy of circumstance, we would not otherwise associate. Growing friendships and rivalries over time, only to discover what the treasure of the field truly is. Do you think there's treasure in this field? The treasure is here between us, is it not? It's not often you see a female writer populate their writing with exclusively male characters, and odder still to see the screenplay ends up being one of the most chaotic, but touching, that Jump has written thus far. Then again, as the film says... What this party lacks is the civilising influence of women. The Alma Alfred archetype, the iconic genius with his creative partner working in his shadow, didn't end in the 60s. It's a dynamic that continues today. Fran Walsh has been a permanent fixture of Peter Jackson's writing team since they got married in the 80s, and much like Jump and Revel, made the decision to be the anonymous half of the storytelling duo. Producers Emma Thomas and Deborah Snyder both produced their husband's films, and that makes a lot of sense. Production is a different but twinned discipline, the left-brain pragmatism that allows the right-brain creativity to make its way onto the screen. So the idea of a creative couple tackling one project from opposing sides actually starts to look better than the usual friction you get between a creative and their studio. A creative partnership is a relationship, an open and honest exchange between two people built on a foundation of shared trust and shared passion. The films of Amy Jump and Ben Wheatley are so unique, so idiosyncratic, it's hard to imagine two people not joined at the hip getting on the same page with each other from the outset. But are these better halves largely uncelebrated because as Alma Revel put it, they're unable to project the image of authority a director has to project. It's an easy mistake to make, but listening to their opinions on the dynamic, I don't think it's that simple, especially not in Jump's case. Jump's anonymity is not a case of recognition denied, but a very deliberate choice for a very deliberate reason. High Rise is the only adaptation in Amy Jump's filmography, based on the 1975 novel by J.G. Ballard, a novelist whose work has also been adapted by the likes of Steven Spielberg and David Cronenberg. Set in a self-contained luxury tower block, the High Rise is essentially a diagram of class structure, with the lower middle class families on the bottom floors. We're down in the bottom, in all sorts of shadows. Most families are, real ones anyway and the super-rich at the top. Your husband appears intent on colonizing the sky. And who can blame him? When you look at what's going on down at street level. The resulting descent into tribal warfare as the building begins to fail also mirrors the emerging class warfare of the 70s, the story becoming an allegory for consumerism and cutthroat capitalism. It's my paint! 
That's why the last words of the film are spoken by Margaret Thatcher. There is only one economic system in the world, and that is capitalism. The woman who deregulated the markets and began Britain's own descent into becoming a consumerist society, to the point where, in many ways, we're still living in Thatcher's Britain today. Things would be better if we could afford to move to a higher floor. This isn't the end point of the book, of course. It was published four years before Thatcher's election, but that's one of Jump's twists of genius that recontextualised the story. Ballard's book was speculative fiction, a prediction of where the political landscape of the 70s could go, but by setting the adaptation firmly in a quasi-retro alternative past, where the book looks forward, the film looks back, becoming an origin story of sorts for the current state of society. Ballard's style meshes beautifully with Jumps, her driving use of theme, giving every line of dialogue double or triple meaning. I thought you were empty. One particular theme keeps popping up. Change, or the lack thereof. As the society of the high-rise changes, the main character of Dr. Lang finds himself unable to change with it. You haven't changed? I'm sorry, I don't think I can. Only to ultimately learn that he doesn't have to. A statement that perhaps this world of barbarism isn't so different from polite society, and that we navigate it in much the same way. Keep the same. There isn't any. It's only the characters previously suppressed that manage to grow and self actualize by the end of the story. Which one of you bastards is going to fuck me up the ass? Jump also sustained another ongoing theme of the book people classified and interpreted as machinery, mechanisms that can be viewed dispassionately and manipulated as such. The fact is, we're all bio-robots now. I mean, none of us can live without the equipment we surround ourselves with. Of course, this is the flaw of Jeremy Irons' character, Anthony Royal, architect of the high-rise, assuming people can be managed like machines. By the way, I hear you're fucking 374. <laughs> My name is Charlotte Melville. But as the technology in the building begins to fail, acting contrary to their designs, so too do the people of the high-rise also begin to disobey and break their intended patterns, descending into anarchy. On release, the film was divisive with audiences and critics, partly, I think, because it was sold as an apocalyptic thriller, not dissimilar to sci-fi tower block action movie Dread, released about three years prior. The marketing disguised Jump's consistently tar-black sense of humour, the film's satirical tone and the surreal dreamlike quality of the story's theming. In any case, Amy Jump stuck to telling Ballard's story in a suitably Ballardian way, and rather than folding to the demands of a market that once IP turned into bland action dross, chose instead to satirise it pointedly. Which you have to admit earns her a lot of respect. Also, they shoot a murder scene through a kaleidoscope, and it's amazing. In all honesty, I barely scratched the surface of Jump and Wheatley's filmography. There's so much more I wish I could learn about the way Amy Jump works, but look for an interview with her, and much like Fran Walsh and Alma Revel, you'll find nothing. Like, barely an idea of what she even looks like. I could only find two photos, which I won't share here, and I'll tell you why. Jump's philosophy, her reason for her self-imposed anonymity, is pretty simple. Can I very quickly ask you, and I've, I've asked you this before, but I do think it's fascinating. You work all the time with uh, Amy Jump and she writes and she edits and you are constantly out there with the movies, doing Q&As, uh, on Twitter, reading... Who's your partner, you should say, in life? Yeah. Yes, but all, but I, actually in this particular case, uh, the c c yes. filmmaking partner, but yes, also yes. enough. Um, and Amy Jump does no, doesn't do the press, doesn't do any of that stuff because her belief is that the work should speak for itself. And between you, therefore, you seem to have like a perfect thing, which is somebody who's very front-facing and somebody who's just not having anything to do with that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I totally respect her stance. I wish I could, I wish I thought of it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I think it's, you know, she's, her, her energy's, you know, focused on the on the filmmaking. And I think, you know, her kind of motto is almost, is always like too much chat. There's too much chat. Don't talk about it so much. No, everyone should just stop talking, you know, and just get on with the, on with the making. There is an additional pressure for creators, on top of the demands of creating, that they must essentially be their own advertiser, a piece of entertainment in and of themselves that will promote what they've made. 
to appear in interviews and be charming and funny and interesting enough to drive eyes to their films. Some directors are suited to it, some less so. David F. Sandberg actually commented on this recently, laying out the difficulties an introvert has in selling themselves as a creator. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with atypical autism. I had one experience early on when I came to Hollywood, when I had prepared this whole pitch, and in the middle of it, the producer said, stop, I don't want to hear about that, talk about this instead. And that just froze up my brain, and the pitch went to shit. There are directors who are good in a room. I'm not going to mention names, but there's this one guy who has done some big movies that haven't been great and haven't always done well at the box office either. But he's been hired over and over again because he's good in a room. He can get you all fired up about an idea and make you go, yes, here's money, go make it. I don't think I'll ever be that person. It's just not who I am. But there's always room for improvement. The interview industry partly forged the stereotype of the lone genius. The myth that a great work is the result of one person's innate brilliance. A myth that the industry uses to sell a product. And in this chat that Jump is talking about, art that is supposed to be interpreted by an audience gets over-explained, simplified, feeding the idea that interpretation is just navel-gazing and there exists a canon answer to every question. But look at the history of collaboration, and you find pairings like David Lynch and Mark Frost attesting that both creators have different interpretations on their shared work, and neither can be considered true. Lynch actually subscribes to Jump's philosophy of too much chat, and has a habit of shooting down interviewers' search for answers. But am I right in thinking that that's at least in the right area? No. <laughs> Interpretation is our job, the audience's, not the creator's, and by choosing to remain completely absent from the marketing machine, Jump's work remains an open book, inviting us to scrutinise it. It can be frustrating never knowing whether you got the right answer or not, but then again, by Jump's philosophy, there isn't one. <laughs> Free Fire is a Bostonian crime epic, opening with a gun deal that immediately goes wrong and the whole movie just gets stuck there. Taking cues from police reports on real armed standoffs, Amy Jump essentially writes a subversion of the Hollywood movie Shootout. I forgot who said I'm on. It's not easy to write a crime epic, or an action flick, or a bottle movie, but Jump manages to do all three at once in Free Fire, lacing in all the twists, mysteries, and shifting tensions needed to keep such an isolated story going. And also, she wrote the best character introduction line ever written. Vernon was misdiagnosed as a child genius, and he never got over it. In true subversive form, every single character gets shot in the first 30 minutes and slowly bleed out over the course of the film. Their goals and conflicts becoming decreasingly small and increasingly pathetic. Jesus! Babu Sise's character even gets shot in the head, only to remind us that I'm not dead. Before waking up going mental and dying mid hallucination. That's beautiful. Jesus fucking Christ. While most filmic firearms are essentially an instantaneous death ray, in reality, most trained shooters barely hit anything, and gunshot wounds mean a slow, sluggish death. They even refer to it. It's the golden hour and a half to rule. The time in which your chances of survival with medical intervention are at their highest. It's no coincidence that that's the exact runtime of the film. Nor is the presence of another Jumpian character quietly plucking the narrative along in the background. I must admit, I never tire looking at it. Jump even teases a romantic femme fatale ending. Can you get out of here? You find a first restaurant? Only for the audience's and the main character's expectations to be dashed at the last minute. It's an ongoing pattern in her scripts. Her perspective characters are rarely the ones that discover their innate power. Instead, it's the character who's quietly smarter than everyone else in the room, who discovers their own power while no one is paying attention, and whose absence causes things to fall into anarchy. What this party lacks is the civilizing influence of women. Jump's films tend to say that self-actualization doesn't need recognition, and that validation comes from the self, 
and not the celebration of others. You seem like a nice girl. We can't all be nice girls. Amy Jump might not be recognised as a lonely genius auteur, but then again, she doesn't want to be. Her next film looks to be Freakshift, a monster hunting horror flick, and she's even attached to the upcoming Tomb Raider sequel. And a good thing too, because looking back over her career, it's clear that Amy Jump is a writer that takes risks. And as the last line of the movie says, hey, You take what you want, girl. Be sure to smash that subscribe button. Hitchcock Touch had two hands, and four of them were Almas. General Kenobi!